Hello! Welcome back to my channel, and today I'm going to be making a Snow White costume. But not the Disney Snow White, my own sort of more traditional version of Snow White. If you hear a chewing sound, that's just my puppy next to me. This is going to be my Halloween costume, and I love basically all of the fairy tales, but the reason I chose this one is because I have this really nice black wig, and I've never really had a good use for it. I also have a pretty ghostly complexion, so Snow White seemed appropriate. Some of the aspects of this design are still kind of up in the air, and I want to just sort of be creative with it as I go along. But I do know that I want it to generally be inspired by the fashions of the late 16th century, because that's when it's usually agreed upon that Snow White takes place. Some more of my inspiration comes from illustrations of Snow White from the turn of the century. There's a couple from this version of Snow White, which I believe is from 1895, and I just think that it's really cool to sort of have this blend of beauty ideals from the turn of the century, but still clearly inspired by the 16th century. So I kind of want to make this from the perspective of like an 1890s person making a Halloween costume of Snow White. So like, it's a little bit periodception. Because I'm going to be a little bit more creative with this project, I don't have a design already drawn, but I'll show you the materials that I know I'm going to use. I found this sheet at the thrift store. It is largely polyester, but it's a costume, so I don't really care. Then I have two materials from what I believe was a really old tablecloth that I got many years ago. This is the lining. I'm not exactly sure what it's made of, but it's a little bit sort of slippery. And then this was the main material of that tablecloth. This is just like the most gorgeous fabric I've ever seen. I think that this is linen and it's embroidered all over and it's absolutely heavenly. And I've been waiting to use this for years, but I just, I couldn't use it on the wrong project. I had to be sure that it went to a good use. Snow White takes place in the 16th century Germany, but I'm gonna base this more on 16th century fashion in England because I just like it a lot more. I really don't like the bodice silhouettes of the German fashion of the time. So this is like a mishmash of a lot of inspirations. So I'm just gonna see where my inspiration inspiration takes me, though I do know a little bit of what I'm going to be doing. Hello there, Missy. Are you wanting affection? I'd like to be able to use the skirt for this again in the future, so I'm going to have it be separate from the bodice. And then also taking this from the perspective of a turn of the century person, they would have done a separate bodice and skirt most of the time at that era as well. So let's get started with the skirt and we'll see where the design takes us. As far as I can tell, skirts from the 16th century were usually pretty plain. I mean, unless you're talking about Queen Elizabeth, who was like the most extra person ever, but essentially one material, even if it was embroidered. And I think they were made relatively similarly to skirts in the 18th century. These would be made with a back piece and a front piece, so you sort of like tie the back part onto yourself like a backwards apron, and then you pull the front up like a frontwards apron, and then you have a skirt all the way around. I don't know if that makes sense, but you'll see when I make it. And then of course to incorporate this gorgeous thing, I'm going to use an apron. So we'll have the gathered skirt made of this and then an apron over top of it with this. So for the skirt, I'm going to cut out two big rectangles of this. The width of the rectangle doesn't particularly matter, it just needs to be much wider than me so that it can be gathered into a skirt. And then the length just needs to go from my waist to the top of my feet. So I'm going to cut those rectangles out and also some really really long strips of fabric that are maybe like an inch and a half thick. It's been a long time since I made something as simple as this. I'm gonna see how easy it is to rip this fabric, because if I can just rip it instead of cutting it... Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. The fact that I can rip it like that is awesome, because that means that I can just tear it into a very even rectangle without needing to measure stuff. Puppy, you're on top of the fabric. There's a dog on top of my fabric. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. So I am just gonna guess how long this needs to be. Oh, ripping fabric like that is just the most satisfying. Okay, I folded this in half, and now I'll rip it into two. And you know, I think for fun, I'm gonna do a little strip of this dark blue fabric right along the hem. And I have a feeling this will be very, very easy to rip as well. Oh yeah. That one felt almost like ripping paper. That was very weird. And that's maybe three inches wide. When you do this, you do have to like pull a lot of the sort of threads out. You get a lot of fraying bits that you need to remove. I'm kind of wondering if this is silk, because these fibers are like incredibly fine. Like you can't even really see the individual fibers. It's very, very fine. And this is also very old. And when silk is really old, it starts to sort of shatter. And I think that's why this is so easy to tear. I could be wrong. I don't know. I think it's just a possibility. And I think I'm also gonna use this blue for the waistband. 
This has to be silk because it has these tiny little, I think, moth holes and moths don't eat polyester. So has to be silk. I am very likely using a turn of the century tablecloth for this. That's my estimation. So I don't know how I feel about that, but it what's done is done. Okay, now that I've torn up a storm, let me show you all that I have. We have two big rectangles, skirt front, skirt back. Two strips of the dark blue fabric that will go on the bottom of the skirt front and the skirt back. And two thinner strips of the dark blue fabric that will be the waist ties for the front and back. So the first thing I'm gonna do is attach the wider dark blue strips to the bottom of the main skirt pieces. I'm just gonna do this by lining up the edges and I'll sew a back stitch all the way along that. And then I can flip this back and you'll have a nice clean finish. And I'm gonna do that for the front and the back of the skirt and then I'll come back to you. It's another day and I've finished sewing on the bottom strips of the skirt pieces. Not only that, but I've also hemmed around all of the sides of each piece except for the top edge where the waist is going to be. What I'm gonna do now is take this top edge and pleat and pin it right sides together with the waistband strips. So I'll pleat all of this carefully. So it'll be pleated like that all the way along, but I'll do it more carefully and it'll be symmetrical. Then I'll lay the waistband strip on top of that and sew along the top edge. I've pinned it just to show you how this will work. Then I'll be able to flip it open and wrap it over the back side of the skirt and whip stitch it into place. This will sort of encase that raw edge. And I'll do this the same way for the front and back half of the skirt. Oh, and when I'm doing the waistband and sort of like encasing the raw edge in there, there's gonna be a bunch of extra waistband hanging off. And I'm also gonna be whip stitching that to be closed so that I have a long strap to be able to tie around my waist. All right, I'm just hanging outside with the doggies and I still need to finish off the straps, but I want to show you what we're going to do next. Once those straps are finished off on both sides, we're pretty much just going to have two aprons. So I'm just going to put them right sides together and then starting maybe like eight to 10 inches down, I'm going to start whip stitching the sides closed. I'll do that on both sides and then the skirt will be finished. Time to bring out Nancy and she's going to help us start on the bodice. For this, I am largely just going with the flow. We're gonna see what happens. And I'm gonna start with this beautiful material. By the way, if you hear some snuffling and chewing, that's my dog behind the camera, as is the life with a puppy. So I think what I'm wanting is to have a piece of this right in the center front in like a triangle shape. So I am just cutting a chunk of this. I'm gonna put this right there. And I think this is gonna work well with a square neckline. And as you may know, my usual way of doing stuff draping on a mannequin is I just do one half and then later we take the fabric off and fold it in half and cut it out so that it's symmetrical. Something that I find to be a kind of interesting dynamic here is that 16th century fashion was largely very straight lines and sharp shapes, but then 1890s was very round and curvy stuff. So I need to kind of blend those somehow with this. So I'm just trying to think like, how would someone in the 1890s approach a 16th century inspired costume? I feel like this triangular front shape is a very iconic 16th century thing. So I feel like I'm gonna do that and this is gonna be pretty straight lines, but then the side of the silhouette is still gonna be pretty curved like my mannequin is. And something I really like about this 1890s Snow White illustration is that the bodice goes farther down than the waist. A really common thing for 1890s fashion was to just sort of be at the waist and then come down to a point a little bit in the front. But with this, I want it to actually be like closer to the hips. I'm gonna take this off real quick and fold it in half 
so that I can cut it out symmetrically. All right, I'm liking that as a start. Something very useful is that for the bottom of this bodice, I am gonna need to do some edge binding, and I happen to have an edge binding that matches this almost perfectly. So this is just gonna be sort of our new accent color. Okay, I'm draping this to go significantly onto the back, and I'm just trying to smooth the fabric out as much as possible. Now you can kind of see how the fabric is starting to like be weird right around the waist because it starts going out again at the hips. And this is where we're going to incorporate these tabs that you see in the 1890s illustration. We're going to have a tab right there and another one right there. And that should already make the fabric a little bit easier to smooth out. And I'm just going to kind of start cutting. As I said, I'm doing this in a very go with the flow kind of way. If you have no idea what I'm doing right now, Neither do I, to be quite honest with you. I'm just doing what feels like a good idea. That's something I really like about doing stuff on a mannequin, is you can just kind of do your best to make the fabric smooth, and then cut where you feel like there should be a seam. As far as making it look historical, I'm pretty good at doing that just because of how many pictures I've looked at of historical clothing. Something you must not forget when you're draping on a mannequin is that you do still need seam allowance. So you don't want to cut exactly where you're putting a seam, but a little bit outside of that so that you have a little bit of extra fabric. Okay, so the issue I've come into is that this spot right here does in fact need a dart. The most microscopic dart, just like a little, a little bit right there. And I'm just gonna do that because I unfortunately made the triangle not have enough seam allowance. Do as I say, not as I do. Okay, do you see what I mean? Just right here, it's a little, it's just a little bit funny. All right, that is incredibly subtle. I'm okay with that. Let's move down to these tabs really quick because they're not really like shaped like anything. So I'm just gonna, usually tabs were a little bit tapered. All right, good enough. And now let's look at the back. I'm just gonna trim the neckline. I'm going to cut a slant right here. So I actually think that I don't need as much of this as I thought I did. I'm just going to cut it right here. Alrighty. I'm so far quite pleased with how this is going, but I am going to finish this another day because my puppy desperately needs to go for a walk and I'm going to lose the light soon. So I will see you in the blink of an eye. All right, the light kind of sucks now, but let us continue anyways. I've actually decided that I don't like this blue. I mean, I like the blue, but when I put the skirt with it, it just, it's not, it's not it. I like this fabric better because it's less stretchy, meaning it's easier to work with, but this material, the color will just be so much better when I have it with the skirt. So I will be cutting this piece out again out of this fabric, and I'll also be using this to finish draping the pattern. So let's start working on the side piece. I'm pretty much just starting by matching it up with the edges of the first piece. I've decided I want another seam right there, so that's where I cut it, and then I'm just working on the tabs. See, this fabric is just so much more of a pain to cut. Almost like when I try and cut it, the fabric moves out of my scissors. So, yeah, I really wish I had a fabric that was this color, but the same texture as this blue stuff. For evidence of this, just look at how this edge is all jagged. It just does not want to be cut straight. Now I just need a piece to finish the back. I do want there to be a gap in the middle for me to lace it up. Now here's where I have a little bit of a dilemma, is usually with 16th century dresses, if they were laced in the back, it would have just been like close, like the edges would meet. But in the original Snow White story, the evil queen gives Snow White some ribbons that are like enchanted so that they lace themselves tighter so that it suffocates her. I know it's a fairy tale, they're usually very gruesome. So that would mean for the ribbons to actually get tighter in order to like make the bodice be tighter, there would need to be a gap here to begin with. And I've seen that for like front closures of 16th century dresses, but I'm not so sure about back closures. It also usually would have been spiral lacing for the 16th century, but by the 1890s, they would have done cross lacing. So which to choose is the question. I think for the sake of the story, there does have to be a gap. It's a costume. I can do whatever I want. And with that, 
the pattern for the bodice is drafted. So I'm going to have to cut out all of these pieces again, mirrored for the other side, and also recut out this piece. The sleeves are not going to be drafted on the mannequin, obviously, because the mannequin does not have any arms. Um, but also, I'm going to need to be making a panel that's going to go behind the lacing, but I'm going to cross that bridge when I get to it. For now, I'm going to take all of these pieces, once I have them all cut out, and I'll put them right sides together and sew along all of these seams using a running stitch. FYI, I totally meant to say a back stitch. Nothing super special, just the way you see them assembled here is how I'm going to sew them together. You may hear puppy sounds in the background, she is playing quite enthusiastically right now. But anyways, here is the bodice. All of those main seams are sewn together and I can kind of sort of try it on, but it's really flimsy right now. So we need to add some boning. I have this cotton bias tape and I'm going to use this to make channels for the boning to go into. I've sewn one on halfway so that I can show you how it works. I put the nice side of the bias tape up against the raw edge of one of these seams and then I sewed a straight line and then I should be able to fold that over and whip stitch the other side. Then you stick the boning in and sew the ends closed. I'm gonna do this on a few of the seams and then I'll come back to you. So I started putting the boning into the channels. I finished sewing the channels, but now I've decided that I don't, I don't like the boning being in the front. So when it's actually on and I pull it tight, it just, it's just a little weird. It's a little wonky. It's making the fabric pull a little bit strangely. And I think that could have been avoided if I used two layers, but I didn't. Um, and I feel like it just will be nicer if I don't have the boning in the front at all. And that is how they would have done it in the 16th century. Just in the 1890s, they usually would have put boning in. So I did. But I think going the 16th century route will work better. And here it is without the boning. I just think it's just a little bit better. So anywho, that's how the front is going to be. We're not going to put the boning in there. But I am still going to have the boning in the back because I can't really do a lace-up back without boning, otherwise it like scrunches up when you try and pull the laces tight. So yeah, boning is still going in the back. We're taking it out of the front. All right, I've got this piece of boning in on each side, and now I need to make another channel right on the edge of the opening in the back. To do this, I'm gonna do a little folding over the edge and then folding it over again, and then whip stitching it on the edge to keep it in place. Then I can slide a little piece of boning in there and sew the ends closed. And then I have this bias tape. This is how I'm gonna be finishing off this whole bottom edge situation, and it's going to be a huge pain. Here's what bias tape looks like close up. You can see that I can unfold it, and then these edges are also folded in. So this is all a slightly wider strip. I'm gonna use this mostly unfolded with the good side up against the good side of this bottom edge. This is one of the tabs here. So you put the bias tape unfolded up against that and sew along this top crease. So for example's sake, I'm just gonna pin that in place for now. When I actually sew it, I'll do a running stitch. I don't even need to do a back stitch because it doesn't need to be terribly strong. And once that's done, you can fold this over to the back and whip stitch it to the other side. That way you're kind of encasing all of these raw edges of the tabs inside of the bias tape. Now the most annoying part of this is that I'm not just going along a straight edge. I need to wrap the bias tape around each of these annoying tabby pieces. And this can take some weird fiddling and folding to make it actually like 
nicely go around the corners, if that makes sense. I did the same thing to finish off the edges of my 1910s corset, but that was a much smoother edge, and that already took me quite some time, so this is probably going to take a while. Oh yeah, and here's the neckline, and you see how this boning is right here? It makes it that I can't really do the folding it over twice and sewing it to finish off the edge, so I'm going to use the bias tape there as well. But anyway, I'm going to start by putting the boning into the edges of the opening, and then we can start doing the bias tape. Alrighty, Halloween is in a week, so I really gotta get this thing done. I've finished putting the bias tape on, so now I have Paranorman on the TV watching some good Halloween content, and I am going to start finishing off the armholes here. I am still gonna be attaching sleeves, but they're, they're not normal sleeves, so I still need to have the armholes finished. So I'm just gonna use a little rolled hem to finish the armholes, and as soon as I'm done that, I'm gonna start working on the laced back. A lot of people are familiar with the eyelets that you have on a corset that are made of metal. It's like a little grommet and that's where you stick the lacing through, but they wouldn't have done that in the 16th century. They would have done hand sewn eyelets. I honestly think that those will work better for this anyways because I do have these metal eyelets, but they kind of only work and stay really well if they're on a really thick material and this is not very thick. So I'm going to do the hand sewn kind. So I'm going to watch some Halloween movies and get to work. Alright, the armholes are finished off, and now we need to work on the sleeves, which means I need to make a lot, a lot, a lot of strips of fabric. I'm going to be doing 16th century slashed sleeves, which were very popular with royalty especially, which is appropriate for this being that it's Snow White. So this will basically mean the puffed section of the sleeve, which I'm going to have right here. I'm actually going to have probably one by the elbow as well, but it'll be made of strips that are not attached, and then I'll have a chemise underneath that I can sort of pull through the gaps. That'll make more sense once I actually start assembling everything. But that does mean, so I will decide on the length of the sleeve and then have each strip probably be like maybe an inch and a half-ish and then a little seam allowance so that I can hem all the way around each piece. I think probably like that long for the strips. I'm not totally sure what that is, but maybe like seven inches. And I'll cut out probably around 20 or something like that. We'll see how many I need. I have a bunch of these strips made and I do still need a couple more, but I'm not gonna make them right now and you'll understand why later. So right now I'm gonna start attaching these at the bottom of the arm's eye. I'll just put one right sides together with the edge of the arm's eye and do a whip stitch to attach it. Then I also have these rectangular pieces that I cut out and these are going to be the tight part of the sleeve that goes on the upper arm. These pretty much go from where I expect the puffed part to end to my elbow. And I've made this just the right size so that I can bend my arm and have it not be like ridiculously tight. So I'm gonna fold this in half right sides together and do a running stitch to close it on this edge and turn it into a tube. I meant a back stitch. I don't know why I keep confusing the two. And then I'll just need to hem the two openings. So I'm gonna do all that and then I'll show you the next steps. Oh, 
I've sewn six of the strips onto each arm's eye, and I've also sewn together these tighter parts of the upper sleeve. And I've hemmed one of the openings of one of these tubes, and that means that I can start sewing the other ends of these strips to this. And I'll be sewing these together using the same method we just used with just a whip stitch. Now, as you may be able to see, I didn't sew the strips to a decent section of sort of the armpit area of the arm's eye, and the reason for this is that the circumference of the arm's eye is bigger than the circumference of this tighter sleeve piece. This means that when I attach the other ends of these strips to this tighter arm piece, it's gonna fill up really quickly and I'm not gonna have any gaps. In fact, because of how much smaller this is than the arm's eye, I'm gonna need to overlap these ends a little bit just to make them fit. And so you may ask, what am I gonna do about the gap on the armpit? And that's why I said before that I do actually need more of these, but I waited until now because they need to be triangles, not just strips like this. So the height of the triangle is gonna be the same length as one of these strips. And the base of the triangle is going to be the same measurement as this gap that I have at the armpit. Of course, I'll need to add a little bit of seam allowance so that I can actually hem the piece. Then I can attach the wide end of the triangle to this, and then I can tack the point down to this. That might sound really confusing, hopefully it'll make more sense when you actually see it. So I'm going to cut out and hem two triangles that are the height of this with a base that is the same as this gap. I have this whole top section of the sleeves finished. Now at the end of this is where the elbow is. And the plan was to have this dark blue strip situation also at the elbow and then another tight sleeve section for this part of the arm. But it's the 29th. Halloween is in two days. So I'll see if I have time for that, but at this point the bodice is quite complete, I just need to put the lacing holes in there. I'm gonna use an awl to poke the holes into this, but if you don't have an awl, something I used to do is get a really thick needle to stab the holes and then force a pencil into it. Then to keep the holes open and stop them from fraying, I'm gonna finish them with pretty much a blanket stitch. If you don't know what the stitch is, first imagine a whip stitch when you're just stitching along the edge of some fabric. That's how we attached the sleeves, like this. And when you're going to tie this off, you make a stitch and before pulling the thread all the way through, you put the needle through the loop of thread and then you pull it tight. For a blanket stitch or buttonhole stitch, it's basically doing that but for every single stitch. So you pretty much get a little knot at the edge of the fabric all the way around the buttonhole. Or in this case, the lacing hole. I'm gonna need a lot of those, it'll take me a long time, so I'll probably do most of that if not all of it off camera. So now, let us draft a chemise. I'm gonna show you how to draft the pattern. Unfortunately, my mic malfunctions, so I'm gonna have to narrate this, but this is a really easy pattern. It's basically just three rectangles. I used the handy dandy method of just tearing the fabric to get the edges nice and straight, and I'm gonna explain to you how to get the dimensions for this first rectangle, which is the body of the chemise. The width of the rectangle doesn't need to be terribly specific, just approximately twice your bust or hip measurement, whichever is bigger. It should just be big enough to fold in half and create a huge tube that you can easily fit your body into. For the vertical measurement of this rectangle, you're just gonna wanna measure from where you want the neckline to be to where you want the hem to be, with a little bit of seam allowance, of course. Now we're gonna set this first rectangle aside for a minute while we work on the others, and at this point, my mic magically fixed itself, so back to past Miranda. The next two rectangles are going to be the sleeve, so they'll be identical. For the first dimension, it just needs to be big enough to be a very baggy sleeve. So that should be significantly more than enough to go around the top of your arm or the arm's eye. Then the other dimension is obviously just the length of the sleeve, so going from your shoulder to your wrist with your arm outstretched. And also a little bit of seam allowance. And now I'll just make this same piece again. Now there's just a little change that needs to be made to the first rectangle. Hold it up with the skirt hem at the bottom, and then fold it in half. Then fold it in half again the same way. Now hold up this corner on the folded side up against where you want the neckline to be. Then going down from there, figure out where you want the bottom of the sleeve to be, so just a little bit below your armpit. Now you're gonna cut out sort of a half armhole using that as the mark for the bottom of the armhole. Something like that. Now when you unfold this, you should have a U shape that fits nicely under your arm. And with that, the pattern pieces are all done. Now the way I'm gonna sew this together is with this big piece folded in half, 
I'm gonna sew along this edge to make it be a really big tube that I could fit my body in. But I'm gonna leave about four inches at the top of this edge not sewn together, and you'll see why later. And we're also gonna sew the sleeve pieces into a tube that can fit very baggily over your arm. Then to sew the sleeves to the body, I'm just gonna pin the body to my clothes so that I can explain this properly. You're gonna sew the bottom half of the top of the sleeve to this U shape on the body. So you'll sew them together like that. And then we'll do all of the finishing shenanigans later. And the nice thing about this garment is I can actually wear it after Halloween, not just for like some outfits and other costumes, but I can wear it as a nightgown, which is kind of fun. So yeah, I'm just gonna start sewing all of this together using a back stitch. I have all of the pieces of the chemise sewn together. Now, if you recall the big seam going down the body of the chemise, I left a couple inches right here that are not sewn together. So what I'm gonna do is just fold those raw edges under and sew them so that this is nice and clean. And then I'm gonna start making a drawstring channel that's gonna go all the way around the top of this over the neckline and the sleeves. And you might be like, what neckline? Because this is giant, but this is, this is a neckline and the top of some sleeves. It's just really huge because it's gonna be gathered later. So all around this top edge, I'm gonna fold it over twice and then sew it just along the bottom. That way it'll be sort of an empty channel and I can insert some string in there later. And I'm gonna do the same thing at the bottom of the sleeves. So that way the bottom of the sleeves will be gathered to fit my wrists. <laughs> Hi, Eve. Once I insert the string, the chemise will basically be done. All right, so I'm wearing the costume right now, so I'm not gonna show you all of me, but I was going to hem a big rectangle of this beautiful embroidered fabric to be sort of like an apron-y thing, but I think I'm actually gonna skip that, partly because Halloween is tomorrow, and also because if it was the 16th century, this would have been hand embroidered, and that seems a little impractical for an apron, so I feel like I can just skip that, and I'm already loving the way this looks without the apron, so we're just gonna go with that and I will put the wig on and show you the finished result. To wander in a forest and feel I'm safe and sound Never shall I worry when now my home is found
that is the finished result of my Snow White costume. This was very time consuming and I also procrastinated a lot. Towards the end I didn't film a whole lot because I was crunching it real hard. This was finished just barely in time for Halloween. And there are a few things to discuss, so let's talk about what's wrong with this. This part is cut on a slightly different angle of the fabric than over here, so this side is a little stretchier, which means this like triangly bit in the middle gets kind of crooked and I have to like yank it back to the middle, but I can make it work. This is editing Miranda and after seeing the reveal footage, the triangle in the middle of the bodice is incredibly crooked and it bothers me a lot. I definitely should have done multiple layers of fabric for the bodice, but I didn't. So what are you gonna do? Sewing is pretty much a never-ending learning process, so now I know. And after taking a look at the footage, I can definitely tell that the back where the lacing is, it's also pulling a little bit weird because of not double layering the fabric. So learn from my mistakes. Another thing, I don't actually know how this happened, is the strips on the sleeves here are not matching in the back. Do you see what I'm talking about? There's like the triangly bit here, and then on the other side, the triangly bit is like way lower. So I don't actually know how that happened. I can fix that. I'll just need to take the pieces, like two pieces off and switch them, and then it'll be fine. But um, yeah, I didn't have time before Halloween to do that. So it is what it is. The chemise part, I love. I have already slept in it multiple times. It was also so easy to make. I made it so fast. And a note, this isn't exactly a con because it's not something that's actually wrong with the thing, but this takes a long time to get into. Because it laces up the back, getting into it yourself is quite difficult. I don't actually completely relace it, but I just have to tighten it and even that is quite a task. There is a piece that I made off camera. This. I made this while I was at work, so I absolutely couldn't film it, but this is just a panel that I made to stick under the lacing so that my bare back isn't exposed through it. I pretty much just cut this shape out of the two materials, sewed them together, and then flipped them right side out. And then I did a top stitch all around the edge. On a non-sewing related note, this wig. I feel fabulous with the black hair, honestly. Excuse Ethy squeaking a toy in the background. This wig does take a little bit of styling to make it actually flat enough on my head to look realistic, but I just, I feel so cool in it. I did have to darken my eyebrows because otherwise it looks a little non-cohesive, but overall, I think the look works very well. And I have already used this skirt for quite a few photos. So after a very long time, the Snow White costume is done. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please comment, rate, subscribe, and all that jazz, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye. And I think that they were made relatively similarly to skirts in the is in the isteenth century. Why, why can't I? I just can't. I have this cotton. <coughs> Hello, can I help you? I have this cotton bias tape and I'm just, <coughs> I'm just trying to say this one line, Ethy. Can you please <coughs> just hold on for a second? Now at the end of this is where the elbow goes. Why, that sounds weird. I don't know why that's it. How do I word this? Trying to eat an apple gracefully can be kind of a struggle. On another note, this is a very good apple. Look at that tree. Look at it, it's beautiful. You're good. Chill. Freaking chill. You're good.